that off focus, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has a packed schedule in Argentina on the sidelines of the G20 summit with several key meetings with top leaders from across the world. Now, the Prime Minister has already met the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman with the two discussing ways to boost economic energy, oil and agricultural cooperation. Prime Minister Modi stressed the importance of stable energy prices and the two leaders discuss ways in which Saudi Arabia, a top crude oil supplier, could help help stabilize prices, particularly for India and also wider defense cooperation between the two countries, said the foreign ministry here in India. Now, the prime minister also later tweeted saying he had a fruitful interaction with the crown prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, we discussed multiple aspects of India, Saudi Arabia relations and ways to further boost economic, cultural and energy ties is what the prime minister said in his tweet about his talk with Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince. Now, the meeting with the Crown Prince uh, was Prime Minister Modi's first in a set of bilaterals on the sideline of the G20 that will be followed by meetings with the US President Donald Trump and the Chinese President Xi Jinping, as well as a meeting with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. The Prime Minister is also had a meeting with the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, where uh, the talks focused on climate change. The talks come ahead of the COP24 climate summit, which is scheduled to take place in Poland from December 2nd to 14th. Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will also participate in two very important trilateral meetings in Buenos Aires. Now, there will be the first ever trilateral meeting between Japan, America and India and the second trilateral meeting between Russia, India and China or RIC. Now, the trilateral which is taking place after an interval of 12 years is between Russia, India and China and is crucial. The Trump Modi Abe meeting will be taking place in the backdrop of China's increasing assertive role in the Indo-Pacific region. The area is said to be rich in mineral uh, oil and natural resources. The United States has been conducting patrols in the region to assert freedom of navigation even as China has built up and militarized uh, many of the islands it controls in the Indo-Pacific. And Siddhan Sibyl, my colleague, is in Buenos Aires in Argentina and is joining us for the latest there on those crucial meetings between Prime Minister Modi and top world leader Siddhan. And we are, of course, counting down to that two uh, main trilateral meetings. And what are you picking up? Uh, what are the kind of discussions that these leaders will be having? Well, uh, Siddhant is live with us, of course, from Argentina, but as I was pointing out, some very key and important meetings there between India and, uh, well, the U.S. and Japan, as well as India, Russia and China. These are two major trilateral meetings that uh, India will be looking out for. What will be the outcomes of th these two meetings, particularly the one with U.S. and Japan, uh, which is going to keep an eye on the Indo-Pacific and countering China's influence in this region but also more importantly what will be the outcome of the meeting between India China and Russia and this will be keenly watched by the United States as it goes into a major trade war with China and also of course uh, that meeting that uh, Trump has cancelled with the Russian President Putin so escalation of tensions between the US Russia and China at the same time India playing a critical role uh, meeting key leaders on both sides of that international divide So those are the crucial meetings, an interesting time for India as a global, uh, global of course, leader uh, in the emerging scenario where two major economies in the world, the U.S. and China, seem to be at war. And Sadan Simbal is back with us now from Argentina. And Sadan, I was, I was pointing out the irony of this. On one side, of course, our meeting with Japan and U.S., on the other with Russia and China, and the, of course, Trump, at, uh, you know, has been sparring with both uh, the Chinese and uh, on the face of it with the Russians as well. 
Well, let me start by saying that uh, we all are facing a little bit network connectivity because of the security here in this city. Because 20 of the top uh, of the uh, top uh, world leaders have descended in the city, and the city is kind of a ghost town. And I'm uh, standing right in the center of the city, and it's completely, uh, completely in lockdown. But talking uh, about the meetings, the two big trilaterals which the Indian Prime Minister is going to have with Japan, uh, uh, America, and India, and RIC, Russia, India, China. It of course also shows uh, that I is a factor of stability i of course for india and it shows india's growing stature in the world especially whether it comes to uh, russia or china or whether it comes to Japan or uh, America, we know that uh, India has been engaging with the Americans, uh, with the Japanese and with the Australians uh, for the Indo-Pacific concept, a concept that has been increasingly gaining currency. And we saw the second quadrilateral meeting is uh, taking place in Singapore just a few weeks ago. So that is why this uh, meeting, the J meeting, the Japan, America, India meeting, which will take place at around 12 a.m. Indian Standard Time is important, shows that uh, India and America are serious about this uh, uh, relationship and this growing engagement, especially on the Indo-Pacific front, which of course is a cause of worry for Beijing. But even despite this worry, Beijing is going forward uh, with the RIC meeting. And even as we speak, uh, the Indian Prime Minister is uh, uh, taking part in the informal BRICS meeting that is taking place uh, just a few uh, uh, kilometers away from where I am standing. And remember the last last year's BRICS informal meeting, which took place in the Hamburg summit, uh, the 12th G20 summit, that was an icebreaker because uh, of that the Doklam crisis diffused. So that is another important aspect. But another important bilateral is with the Chinese president that will take place at 11 p.m. Fourth time the Indian Prime Minister meeting the Chinese president uh, this year shows that both the uh, leaders are really keen to uh, maintain the positive trajectory in the relationship. All right, Sidan, thanks very much indeed for joining us for the latest there. We are counting down to those crucial meetings and we'll keep coming back to you for more on that. And well, uh, staying with news about G20 and of course U.S. President Donald Trump known to go it alone in world forums also has several bilateral meetings lined up. Uh, but Trump's deficit at world forums is well known as well. And Trump is expected to meet the Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, where issues such as trade war are likely to come up, of course. Then there is a meeting with the Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince in the middle of that controversy over the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. This meet will be keenly watched as well, as would be the possible meeting if there is one between Donald Trump and Theresa May. Uh, I remember Trump has publicly slammed Brexit on many occasions. But the most significant announcement uh, already made by President Trump has been him cancelling his meeting with the Russian President Vladimir Putin over the Ukrainian conflict, it seems, hours before his arrival in um, in. Uh, in Argentina, he tweeted, he said, and I quote, based on the fact that the ships and sailors that have not been returned to Ukraine from Russia, I have decided it would be best for all parties concerned to cancel my previously scheduled meeting uh, in Argentina with President Putin. I look forward to a meaningful summit again as soon as this situation is resolved. Trump's tweets came minutes after he said that the meeting with Putin will go ahead as planned. His flip-flop was criticized by the Russians. I probably will be meeting with President Putin. We haven't terminated that meeting. I was thinking about it, but we haven't. They'd like to have it. I think it's a very good time to have the meeting. I'm getting a full report on the plane as to what happened with respect to that, uh, and that will determine what I'm going to do. And joining us to talk a little bit more about the G20 summit and President Trump is Abigail Grace, uh, who is a research associate at the Center for New American Security from Astana. And Abigail, thanks very much for talking to us. Now, Trump has uh, normally, of course, shunned international travel is, and is turning this particular event into one stop, uh, you know, a diplomatic shop, as it were, with seven bilateral meetings scheduled in 48 hours. But, of course, there are many contentious issues nonetheless, one of course being uh, the latest on, on Russia. Yes, thank you so much for having me today. 
So um, on the, the Russia question specifically, I, I certainly think that the president uh, was faced with a bit of a conundrum about how exactly, you know, he was to respond to this latest escalation and tensions that we've seen from the Russians. Certainly, the president has faced criticism domestically here in the United States for not taking a tough enough line on uh, Russian aggression and revisionism, especially in the context of him having criticized former President Obama for not taking uh, many of these similar tactics. So I think that the move to cancel the meeting was an effort for him to try to project uh, an aura of toughness, but whether or not that's actually effective in resolving the immediate crisis of the detained Ukrainian uh, naval officers, I think has yet to be seen. Of course, uh, uh, you know, even as that controversy looms over his meeting with Russia, the other breakout star is, of course, Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And pretty much any leader who meets him uh, will be an event in itself. And particularly Donald Trump, who has supported the Saudi Crown Prince all through the Jamal Khashoggi event. Yes, and I think, too, that the U.S. Congress is certainly seeking to escalate pressure on the Trump administration to try to convince them to change course here. You saw uh, just recently the U.S. Senate voted to end uh, U.S. participation in the war in Yemen, which was certainly, I think, uh, designed to be a message to the Saudis that uh, the, at least the congressional branch of the U.S. Uh, certainly will not let this Khashoggi incident uh, pass without a response. So any meeting uh, from the president with Mohammed bin Salman without uh, sort of bringing up this issue, I think, would be uh, very uh, controversial in the United States. Mm -hmm. But one meeting I think, uh, Abigail, everybody would hope uh, and imagine would happen would be the meeting that President Trump is supposed to have with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. And uh, well, the world would certainly look at it as bad news if that doesn't happen as the trade war escalates and has its impact on world economies. So I think this meeting is certainly likely to take place. It's been over a year since President Trump and President Xi have met in person, the last meeting being uh, President Trump's uh, trip to Asia uh, sort of last November 2017. So I think uh, we can rest assured that the meeting will probably happen. However, I don't think that the meeting is necessarily going to result in any, any real substantive progress. Well, we could see a temporary deal, perhaps the U.S. agreeing not to enact the 25 percent tariffs that are slated to take effect in January. January. The real issues that are driving the U.S.-China trade war are political in nature and really deal more with the competition between the U.S. free market system and the Chinese state-directed economy. And those won't be solved overnight or at any one bilateral meeting. So mm -hmm. I'm a bit skeptical about the prospect for progress here. All right, Abigail Grace, we'll leave it at that for the moment. Thanks very much indeed for joining us with your thoughts about President Trump's meetings with top leaders at the G20, of course, not meeting the Russian President Putin as of now. Now, in all of this, of course, the Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko has said that he has strong evidence that the Russian military tanks are massing along the country's border. Poroshenko has shown a British news channel new images of what he claims are tanks lining up along the border. Uh, and he claims that the tanks are close to where Russia stores its ammunition. Now, Russia on Thursday deployed a new battalion of advanced S-400 surface-to-air missile systems in Crimea. It's fourth such battalion uh, that it has deployed, where which are capable of securing airspace regardless of the target's altitude and speed. The missile system couldn't uh, could hit uh, the target up to 30 kilometers high and speeds up to 2,700 kilometers per hour. News of uh, the new deployment in Crimea which Russia annexed from Ukraine in 2014, follows Russia's seizure of three Ukrainian Navy vessels off the coast of the peninsula on Sunday as well. And uh, Russia had, of course, imposed a de facto blockade on two Ukrainian ports on the Sea of Azov by barring ships from leaving and entering the sea via the Kerch Strait. Ukrainian President uh, Petro Poroshenko has accused Russia's president on Thursday of waiting to annex his entire country and call for NATO to deploy warships to uh, sea shared by the two nations. And meanwhile, the international community, including Germany and U.S., have condemned the act of aggression by Russia. Uh, it was uh, obviously a flagrant violation of international law. It was, I think, a cavalier use of force that injured uh, Ukrainian sailors. It was uh, contempt for 
uh, really for the traditional ways of settling these kinds of concerns if they had any. Uh, and when you think that there is a treaty between the two countries that permits exactly what happened, it just shows uh, that Russia cannot be counted on right now.